Hey guys, this is the 2024 Mazda CX-90. It replaces the off-going Mazda CX-9 and it does it in a big way because it went from a front-wheel drive bias all-wheel drive system to a rear bias all-wheel drive system. So to me, that's huge. It has a very exciting powertrain and I believe that the critics have been unfairly harsh with this vehicle, criticizing many aspects of it. And in this video, I'll tell you why. What if they got it wrong? I want to do something slightly different with the format of this video right off the bat i'll give you my impressions and i will do that by editing the video to put my conclusions at the very beginning to save you time and if you're interested in knowing how i reached these conclusions feel free to watch the rest of the video and if you appreciate the gesture and feel like returning the favor please hit that like button consider subscribing or maybe leave me a comment about your thoughts about my review or maybe about this vehicle in general After a day of driving this vehicle, I can tell you that I absolutely love it. I'm not gonna buy it though, because I have no room in my life for a third row. But what this vehicle did for me, it gave me hopes for what the CX-70 can bring when it comes later in 2024. Especially because Mazda was able to price this CX-90 below the $40,000 mark. So I don't see why the CX-70 couldn't be three to $5,000 less than the CX-90. Let's go over the things that I liked about the CX-90. The driving, it's composed, it's compliant, it's quiet. Yes, it may be a little bit on the softer side, but having BMW products in the past have taught me that at first they may feel a little sporty, but once you get on the road for a few hours, it can start taking a toll on your body, especially the older you get. Number two, the interior. Even in this base model, the interior is pretty upscale. Yes, some of the materials may be a little bit on the cheaper side, but it's up to you. You want to dress it up for ten dollars or $20,000 more and find all the features that you're accustomed to in other premium brands. The simplicity of the design language with just plenty of manual controls and the smaller screen because I don't really care for unnecessary bigger screens just for the sake of it. So this does it for me. The looks, the long hood design looks very upscale. If it wasn't that important, then Acura and Volvo wouldn't be artificially elongating the hoods of their vehicle to give this kind of look. The problem with those is that they're front wheel drive vehicles. So you have a lot of overhang left in the front, which gives you a silly look. And there is a opportunity or things that I didn't like about this vehicle is the brake feel because you have this softer suspension and the brake pedal is hypersensitive. You kind of have this extra nose dive every time you touch that brake pedal. So I wasn't in love with that. And I found the transmission to be a little sloppy downshifting, especially when you come to a complete stop. Sometimes it seems like the transmission is struggling to find the right gear. And once you come to a complete stop, you feel that extra hit on your back, kind of like what you feel when you're driving a dual clutch transmission. Yeah, this is a 3.3 inline six cylinder. It's an all new for Mazda, which is very interesting because this platform is also new for Mazda, as well as the engine in an era where other brands are opting to just update their existing platforms and go with a smaller four cylinder engine, such is the case of the Toyota Highlander. It's also rear bias. It's an eight speed transmission. Remember the CX-90 was an automatic with a torque converter and the engine was sitting sideways. So this CX-90 setup should provide drivers with a better driving experience it's good for 280 horsepower and 332 pounds feet of torque and it runs on regular gas which is such, such a relief especially right now that the gas prices are six and seven dollars per gallon so you can run it on 87 it's still going to give you the same horsepower as if you run it on premium it's rated at 24 in the city and 28 on the highway for a 25 combined mpg which i think is pretty good and very very similar to what the highlander and the pilot offer i've also read in some forums that some owners claim to get better than posted mpg which is great news for a vehicle this size because it's actually heavier than the competition is heavier than the pilot heavier than the highlander and something tells me that it's also heavier than the korean offerings Compared to the outgoing CX-90, this vehicle is wider, lower, longer, and it's also 300 pounds heavier. I find it very relieving that unlike the common trend of making grills larger and larger, the CX-90's front end is a mere evolution of the already great looking CX-9. The grill offers minor changes, basically just, they just got rid of some of the horizontal lines and chrome accents. The lights are larger and are full LED. In higher trim levels, you can get adapted lighting, but these two just great as they are. Down here, you have functional vents and no fog lights. 
one of the very things that I like about this car is that it's actually not trying to look like anything else. If anything, it looks a little bit like the off-going CX-9, which was a great looking car. The side profile of this CX-9 is just astonishing. This very long hood it reminds me of old school S-Classes and maybe the 7 Series because it's very long, so it gives it that premium vibe to this vehicle. You will notice that the side profile doesn't have a lot of unnecessary lines, so they keep it very clean and very classy. Because this vehicle is black, you cannot see that it's got black cladding throughout. So if you don't like black cladding, you're going to have to upgrade to a higher trim level. This is just ornamental. There's nothing here. This just says inline six for whatever reason. I don't understand why Mazda did this. If they wanted something here, they should have made it functional. When it comes to the tires, because this is a Turo Special, these are 19 inch wheels, but they're very wide, 8.5 inches wide, and they're wrapped in 265, 55, all seats and tires. The roof line stays consistent all the way back and then it starts rounding down in the way that the Mazda 3 hatchback does. And then right here, I get a little bit of vibes of the old FX35 from Infinity. And then this huge fuel port. <laughs> Why is it so big? I don't understand. Then moving on to the back, very, very simple. The only thing that I'm gonna ding this car for is that this rear wiper is always visible to the driver from the rear view mirror. These taillights are LED. And they give me a little bit of BMW vibes. Let me know how you feel about these taillights. I like them. I just wish they didn't look too much like BMW because I know this car is not trying to look like anything else, but those taillights remind me of that. And then this reminds me of the FX35. And then down here, you're not gonna have any visible tailpipes, but you are gonna have these fake grills. I guess Mazda couldn't resist giving us fake grills right here for whatever reason. Time to make our way into the vehicle, but let me show you the key fab first. It looks really nice, but honestly, it feels a little hollow. It's kind of heavier at the bottom than here. So I think they could have worked on this. And then you have this controls on the side for the lock, unlock, and then hold it to open the tailgate and this for the emergency. And now the cool thing about it is that it's one of those that has the proximity sensor. That all you have to do is stick your hand in the handle. It's going to open it. And then once we make our way into the interior, I find it very nice. Actually, one of my favorite aspects of the CX-90 is the interior layout. It looks very functional and minimalist with the smaller center screen. It's not a touch screen, but it's easily controlled with the knobs in the center console right here. There's plenty of physical controls throughout that remind me of European offerings from like 10 years ago, but in a good way before everything went crazy with humongous screens and stuff like that. Um, these toggle switches for the AC, they feel of high quality, so everything feels really good when it comes to the controls. And then this is the drive mode selector. It has off-road, normal, and sport. And in higher trim levels, you will get an extra mode for towing. This one doesn't have it, and it actually only tows about 3,500 pounds, which is not a lot. And then this gear selector, even though it looks nice, it feels kind of flimsy as well. I think they could have chosen better materials, but they didn't. And then you have here, you have the heel descent assist and two cup holders. The center console is very wide, which again gives this vehicle the impression of being a premium larger vehicle that gives enough elbow room for both passengers and then what you have here is a split door storage that is very shallow because you got to remember that the dry train passes underneath but it makes up a little bit for it here with this glove compartment that is pretty deep i liked it pretty roomy but it's not lined you have one touch window controls the fuel of quality to the touch but one letdown of this cabin is the surface materials mazda didn't try to give its base model any nicer materials the 2023 nissan rogue that i test drove in this channel has way nicer interior materials than this cx90 there's plenty of scratchy loud materials throughout usually in this segment you're gonna have uh, nicer materials here and yeah i make it a little rough down here but here look at this so here you have injected molding and then the rest is just plenty of scratchy materials this is nice to the elbow but other than that i feel that this car doesn't have a lot of nice materials to the touch and then one thing that experts gave to this vehicle let me close it so you don't hear that shine okay it's gone um, is this basically unusable storage room for the doors but i don't have a problem with it maybe because my lifestyle doesn't demand for a lot of space in the door pockets another thing i wanted to talk about with this car is how they did vinyl seating for the base model. Yes, it's not leather, but it looks really good. And actually they did, they went out of the way to give you some contrasting stitching here and then this trim. So it looks pretty upscale. And to me, in my experience, vinyl interiors hold up better than cloth down the road. In this vehicle you have this base model, remember, 
an adjustable power seat for the driver, but not so for the passenger. The good news about it is that it only takes one trim level up to start finding the power seat for the passenger. No lumbar support though. And then this steering column is manual and you can tilt it, but again, in higher trim levels, you can get this powered. Moving on to the second row. First, let me show you, because of the longer wheelbase, you're gonna notice that you're gonna have a longer rear door than the front door, which when you open, opens almost to a 90 degree, which gives you plenty of space to access into the vehicle. And then once you're here, you're gonna realize that there's plenty of leg room for a normal sized adult. I'm about 5'11", and I left the settings of the front seat as they were, and notice how I still have plenty of leg room for myself back here. The rear seat also tilts a little bit, and then you have this climate controls for the second row and two USB connectors right here. This row is for three passengers, but notice how this is a little bit elevated, which is gonna make a little bit of an uncomfortable ride for a longer distance for the center passenger. But if you don't have a center passenger, then you lower this and you have a comfortable elbow rest with two cup holders. And then let's talk about the third row. Let me show you something. The third row is not easily accessed because this seat doesn't roll in the way that some of the competitors do. So this is never out of the way. At least I couldn't figure it out. So you're gonna have to be super fit and flexible or young to be able to get back here. So let me try it. Okay, so I am back here. And notice how the flooring is not that deep. So your knees are gonna be high up, but it works for shorter distances or for smaller children. But one of the trade-offs of these seven seaters that I don't think they're natural seven seaters is that if you have all the seats up, then you're not gonna have storage for the passengers or you can use it as a four or five passenger vehicle and you're gonna have plenty of storage in the rear. So because one of the seats is up, you're gonna see how small this storage area is. But if you were to lower it, then it transforms into plenty of room for five people and their stuff. So down here, you have some tools and a temporary tire. And this version doesn't come with the privacy cover, but I do not know if higher trim levels do. And this gate is powered, but it's not automatic. Are you guys ready to go for a drive? Because I am. Even though this is not a vehicle for me, I still went out of my way to pay $75 at on Turo to drive this vehicle for a day. So these are gonna be my impressions of a cumulus of impressions throughout the day. And the reason why I rented this vehicle is because I couldn't wait to see what it drove like because I'm used to seeing them on the road. You hardly ever see them, but when you do, they're very impressive, very nice looking. And I do, not have, I do not have room in my life for a third row vehicle, but what about the CX-70? That is gonna be a shorter version of this. It's a five seater and um, that'll be more of my vehicle. And because we know that sedans are a dying breed, Mazda was not gonna produce a rear bias sedan. So everybody's going SUV. So at least they thought outside of the box and went from a front wheel drive platform to a rear bias all-wheel drive platform with this CX-90 and I think they knocked it out of the park. One thing that this car has over the competition, it all depends who you want to compare it with. Is it fair to compare it against the Highlander and the Pilot because they're third row vehicles? Well, I think that this vehicle handles better, has more power than those two vehicles. So I think that you get more for the money. Sure, one drawback of this car is how far high it climbs up once you fully option it. but no need for that because this in its base form is actually pretty good because from the get-go you get this rear bias platform with an inline six with an eight speed automatic that is a without a torque converter because a lot of the power gets lost in translation with a traditional torque converter so this is more similar to a DSG and it has some drawbacks too because it's a little it's a little bumpy downshifting but uh, when you drive it aggressively those shifts come quick and they're crisp 
and it gets this vehicle moving. Just to think that it's a base model with all-wheel drive is it's pretty good. So it offers some of the conveniences of a people mover with some excitement. Can you hear that? That's a little bit of artificial engine noise being piped to the cabin through the speakers, I'm guessing. And um, as I mentioned, when I did the intro to this car, this car has three driving modes, which are gonna be off-road, normal, and sport. If you opt for a higher trim level, it's gonna give you that extra driving mode for towing, but this is rated at 3,500 uh, pounds for towing and the max it can do in other trim levels is 5,000. So it's not much. It's hard to compare this vehicle to others just because it's all over the place in, in terms of features because it's rear wheel bias, kind of like a BMW X7 would be, but it's also cheap or cheaper, kind of like what a Pilot is or can be. And um, it's cheaper than a fully loaded RAV4. So if you ask me, I much rather prefer this over a RAV4 any day. It's also a little bit cheaper than a fully loaded CRV. So if you compare them to those price-wise, I think you get more for the money with this car. I hope you enjoyed watching my video. If you did, please hit that like button. And if you haven't done so, please consider subscribing. I believe that some of the experts were a little harsh on this vehicle because an all new platform that is rear bias, all wheel drive for under $40,000. Where do I sign? Come on, price wise, this vehicle is competing against, for example, a fully loaded uh, Honda CRV, a fully loaded Toyota RAV4. And I'd much rather take this car over those. Sure, the price keeps incrementing up to over $60,000, but that's if you get all the options. But for the base model, I think it gives you a lot. Would I pay over $60,000 for one of these? Probably not but I really appreciate what Mazda did with this vehicle. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.